People are still tuning in, but I would like to just, you know, go ahead and start. My name is Beth Walton. I'm the executive director of Oyster South. Thank you so much for everybody for tuning in, signing up and supporting. Um, real quick, in Oyster, Oyster South, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that supports, sustains, and elevates everything Southern Oyster and sustainable oyster too. Um, we have members from North Carolina, south to Florida, and west to Texas. But you know, we like to say anyone and everyone is welcome. Um, so we have members nationally, internationally as well. So we like to, you know, kind of tell people it's an all-inclusive support system. Um, we've got, you know, students, scientists, farmers, wholesalers, retailers, artists media, you know, all sorts of different people, anybody who's an Oyster fan. Um, and today is our third and final succinct seminar in our series. Uh, we've had two others before this. Um, and if anybody's interested, you can go to our YouTube channel, type in Oyster South and tune in to see those um, as well. So um, with that, I just wanted to real quick introduce our topic for today. And, and for our panelists, a real quick overview of them. Today, we're gonna to be talking about diversity and inclusion in the sustainable oyster industry. And we have an absolute rock star panel of people. Um, so thank you all for joining. We really appreciate it. Um, we've got Elena Guerrero joining us yes. from Grand Isle Sea Farm. We've got Chef Mashama Bailey and Trevor Elliott at the Somebody muted you, Beth. Thanks, Megan, sorry. Thanks, y'all. Um, just going down our list real quick. I don't wanna, um, I'll just do it real quick. Oyster farmers, chefs, podcasters, all sorts of wonderful people. So we've got the Guerrero family represented Louisiana, uh, Mashama Bailey, Trevor Elliott from the Gray in Savannah, Ryan Bethay in North Carolina, Oysters Carolina, Imani Black um, from Minorities in Aquaculture. We've got our moderator, the Oyster Ninja, Gardner Douglas, Julie Chu from In a Half Shell website, Oyster Sommelier, Sustainable Oyster Advocate, Scott Budden from Orchard Point Oyster, and Chef Vish from um, Snack Bar in Oxford, Mississippi. And I think that's everybody. So with that, um, again, just thank you. And what we'd like to do, uh, because we do not have Ernest McIntosh Jr. and Sr. of E.L. McIntosh and Sun Seafood, uh, they weren't able to join us uh, in person, but we do have a short film that we put together um, and they, Ernest Jr. took the time to answer some questions. So I'm gonna go and try to do that right now. Just bear with me for one second. Let's see, all right, play. I don't know if that's playing. Let me try. My name is Ernest McIntosh Jr. Um, I'm co-owner of Ernest McIntosh. Yeah, McIntosh and Sons Seafood. Well, I'm kind of um, third generation in it. My family been in it while harvesting from when I was a little kid and uh, kind of raised up in it. My turn now to be an oyster harvest and an oyster farm. Watching an uh, oyster from the sea to going across the table to being sold, that's part of it. Yes, yes, we have. Um, and that opportunity is a lot deep within yourself. You know, if that's what you want to do, you know, you kind of work hard and try to make it the best you can. Be a little patient because horses don't grow, but so fast, you know, a long time. My grandfather been in it for a long time until so that, since the seventies. You have to move along with, this, you know, what your family can make a living off of with, you know. But like I said, it took a lot of hard work and strive to get where we had. And it just wasn't handed out to us. Um, every bit of those years from day one when we started, I think we earned every bit of it. 
Uh, I believe in uh, the next generation we should start out fresh out of high school or in high school. Uh, I think every form, form or organization should have some kind of uh, high school um, education where they can come and be a part of the form on the summer times, uh, somewhere where they can start getting a little bit of it at an early age and not when they're so far down the line and looking for a large amount of money to get into this business. I think if you start with them at a younger age and give them the insight that it's maybe something they want to do, um, I think that's how we can start this generation and move forward. Everything that comes out of that water around that orchestra is pretty much interesting. And, and it all means something, you know. Uh, There's always something, something for them to learn. And if we can give it more at hand for the younger generation so they can study, then we'll have a better future. All right. We're glad we we're able to get that from the Macintoshes. So thanks to Ernest Sr. and Jr. And to Justin Manley, who got up at six in the morning to go down there and meet the guys yesterday. <laughs> um, you know, and, and with that, um, it's a great um, time to turn it over to our moderator, Gardner Douglas. Um, he is also known as the Oyster Ninja. I'm sure many of you follow him on Instagram and keep up with him. He's also an army veteran and a nationally ranked oyster shucker. So with that, Mr. Gardner Douglas, I'm gonna turn it over to you to help guide our wonderful panel and everybody tuning in in a discussion about diversity and the oyster world. And just thank you for offering your time and talent. So Gardner, you're on. Hey, thanks Beth, appreciate you. Uh, can you hear me okay, first of all? Right, great. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, putting this together. And, um, you know, with all these great people and great, great faces and stories that we've known and heard of. And um, uh, like you said, you know, I uh, have the Oyster Ninja podcast and I'm a national ranked oyster shucker. Um, I have a traveling raw bar here in the BC metro area. And, uh, but my real thrill is uh, um, telling people stories and that's on the Oyster Ninja podcast. So, you know, enough about me. I really just want to show and tell everybody's story that, you know, took their time out to join today. Um, so if we could just start um, with the introduction of our panelists today, and um, uh, you could end that with um, why you join Voice Yourself, and anybody can go first. I'm going to pick somebody. I'm going to say, Julie Chu, you go first. I'm sitting in the front of the class. Hi, <laughs> I'm Julie Chu from In a Half Shell. I started my oyster blog in 2009. So right when oyster renaissance and excitement was happening. Um, I grew up in the Midwest. I was originally born in China. So cuisine there was really centered around seafood, which is why I think I always gravitated to oysters subconsciously. Um, and I spent most of my time in New York City where honestly, like the, the perception of Southern oysters isn't that high just because it's full of blue points, full of these Northeast oysters. And when I got to learn about Oyster South and Southern oysters, I was like, come on, we're like really missing out up here. So I really love championing Southern oysters and this amazing culture that's developing in the South. And that's why I joined Oyster South and have been I guess a longtime supporter. I don't even know how many years it's been, but probably since more or less the beginning and love the symposiums. And uh, now I continue, my passion has been in oyster education, exploring oyster culture around the world. Um, and I'm tuning in to you, all of you from Madrid in Spain. Awesome, thanks Julie. All right, if I'm gonna pick, all right, I'm gonna just randomly pick people. See, Gardner's so super nice, I'm gonna be bossing and be like, no, no, I'm gonna call on people. I, I just don't have like chocolate I can throw at you or something, you know, it's an incentive. So pretend I'm like tossing something at you through the screen. All right, next up is, let's see, we're gonna go with Ryan Bethay. Ryan, you're up. Hey! 
Uh, thanks for having me, everybody. I'm Ryan Bethay from Oysters, Carolina. We are an oyster farm in North Carolina in Carteret County. We harvest all of our oysters and deliver them the same day anywhere in North Carolina. Um, we have free delivery and we have no minimum. So uh, a lot of our clients are folks that may be low income or maybe uh, maybe older and don't have transportation. And we just want everybody to have access to, to the great fishery that we have here. Um, it's great to see everybody. Thanks for putting this call together. This is the first call that I've been on that's oyster slash uh, diversity focused. So I'm really excited. And I think that's kind of uh, shows where we're at. So thanks for putting it on and thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. All right. Uh, let's see. Miss Imani Black, you're up. I, you know, like when you're in class, you just know the teacher is going to pick you next. <laughs> okay. Um, Hi, I'm, my name is Imani Black. I am the founder and president of uh, Minorities in Aquaculture, which is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization that wants to empower, support, and educate women of color um, to step into the aquaculture space in all disciplines um, and wants to kind of be a longevity of resources for women of color that. Um, want to dive into aquaculture as a career path um, or just like interested in knowing about the sustainability efforts that aquaculture provides to our seafood resource. Um, I am originally from the Eastern Shore of Maryland and that's where I currently reside now. Um, I am a faculty research assistant slash grad student at the University of Maryland's uh, Horn Point in Cambridge, Maryland right now. Um, and then uh, I also run uh, Minorities in Aquaculture full-time as well. I originally joined Oyster South. I'm actually probably only like two weeks, maybe like three weeks old in the organization as a member, but I'm super excited to be here and I'm super excited to be a part of the conversation um, and to just dive into the Oyster South community. Um, it seems like a really family wholesome type of community. And I, um, especially for being the representation for women of color um, in uh, kind of shellfish aquaculture. Um, I love to be a part of the community and just learn all that I can. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Imani. We're happy to have you. All right, next up, Scott Button, you're up. Hello, everyone. My name's Scott Button. I'm a partner at Orchard Point Oyster Company. Um, we are a oyster farm located on Maryland's Eastern Shore. Um, kind of a fun fact, I'm from the same part of the Eastern Shore as Imani, maybe even the same town. Um, and she actually was instrumental in getting us our first batch of seed in our nursery. Uh, it was a number of years back, but she ran a, a late package of seed from the post office up to our, our nursery and got us going with our seed. So indebted to her. Um, and another fun fact is Gardner actually, um, I knew how to shuck an oyster, but Gardner really helped me perfect that, especially doing a Chesapeake style. So he's, he's spreading the gospel and getting the good word out there to a lot of people, even oyster farmers that, you know, may know how to shuck. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we've been in business for about seven years now. This will be our seventh growing season. And yeah, we sell through wholesalers, director chefs. Uh, we also do retail as well, um, cold shipping, pickups, all that fun stuff. And we're, I think, we distribute down the South too, uh, through a distributor in Atlanta. So our, our oysters are in the South, in the Carolinas, uh, Florida, um, I think as far West as Mississippi. Yeah, we're on the Gulf Coast, I know that for sure. So um, we're excited to be a part of this and, and join the discussion. I don't think we're a formal member of Oyster South yet, but I've always admired the, uh, the, the pictures and the videos of the party that you guys throw. So looking forward to maybe crashing that one of these days or, or joining and being a part, so. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, you know, we'll, we'll do our announcement later about landlocks. So we're just happy to have you. Happy to have you on here. I love all the fun facts, too. Thanks for sharing those. Those are great. Um, let's see. Next up, we are going to kick it over to Grand Isle. Elena Guerrero, you are up. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Elena. I am just one part of Grand Isle Sea Farm. So I uh, we farm monsters in Grand Isle, uh, Louisiana. That's me, my husband, Boris, and my uh, father-in-law, Marcos, and my mother-in-law, Eulalia. Um, I always like to tell the story of how they got into the oyster farming because I think it's very unique and um, 
I just want to say, um, when this family moved to US about 30 years ago, um, they were always looking for something to do um, in, in farming or um, something organic. So they were, they were looking forever and it just happened so randomly that they picked up a newspaper in the morning and they found that there's gonna be an uh, oyster farm park being opened in Grand Isle. And without knowing nothing about oysters, about farming, about uh, seafood in general, they're like, let's go ahead and try it, why not? And that was about eight years ago and we've been doing it ever since. And um, I think we love it every, every minute of it, even though it has its challenges and a lot of things to learn. And um, why we joined Oyster Sound is really, I think a very simple answer that um, it's the best friend of every oyster farmer in the South and everywhere, because um, I don't think there is any other group. There might, but um, for us, it's worked perfectly. And the people we've met, the connections we've made, I think it's just wonderful. Awesome, thanks, Elena. Yeah, we're happy to have you and your family as part of Oyster South. And fun fact about Elena, she's got a magic setting on her camera to make all those beautiful pictures for their feed, just saying. Thanks, Elena. All right, next up, Chef Vish, you're on. Sorry, uh, so I am Vishwesh Butt from Snack Bar in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, we opened, having technical difficulties, as you can tell. Um, you can't see me. Uh, for some reason, my video has stopped, but uh, I will uh, keep talking. So I'm Vish Fish from, okay, uh, from Snack Bar, Mississippi. Um, in Oxford, Mississippi, we opened in 2009 as, as a small neighborhood uh, brasserie uh, with the oyster bar as the anchor. Um, I am new to oysters. I didn't, you know, I, I had just started eating oysters and, you know, started to kind of fall in love with them. And so when we opened this restaurant, we wanted to make sure that we had an oyster bar uh, for, for people that really enjoy them. And, you know, there was nowhere in North Mississippi you know, to, to share that experience. Uh, and as, you know, as, as we got further along, you know, this is now our 12th year, as, you know, as being open, um, as I started doing, you know, reading and, and you know, meeting folks, uh, you know, other Southern chefs and, and, and learning more about Southern oysters. And that's how I came, uh, you know, to be a part of uh, Oyster South. And, and, you know, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm here to, learn and listen and listen and learn uh, and uh, you know keep sharing whether it's you know southern oysters or you know gulf seafood or what you know talk about uh, families uh, you know who, who work you know along the gulf coast and uh, continue to spread uh, the good word of, of the work they do awesome thank you Vish all right Last but not least, of course, Chefs Mashama and Trevor, you're on. Hi, everyone. Um, Beth, thanks for inviting us to this um, panel. Um, I feel underqualified, quite frankly, to be yes. <laughs> participating in this conversation. But um, I do just want to tell you a little bit, you know, about um, me and us, like uh, we're both from New York City. Trevor's the head chef here. I'm the executive chef um, and we're in Savannah, Georgia. We've been working together for about five years. And, you know, I had the really um, unique opportunity to meet Ernest Sr. and Ernest Jr. before we even opened the Gray and start to have conversations around oysters and um, local seafood. And I think that that really opened my eyes to the culture of um, oysters and the, and the seafood culture in the South and in this region. And also it started to, I started to see like a little bit of the disparities in it. And, um, you know, we just been supporting, you know, local farmers, local um, agriculture um, throughout, throughout the years that we've been working together in this restaurant. And, um, you know, we got invited to a landlock event a few years ago, and that was super amazing to just meet um, people, oyster farmers around the country, um, especially in the South, 
that um, were really focused on sustainability and revitalizing the community. And so, um, you know, we're just here to help try to do our part and just keep this culture alive, really. You wanna say anything? Yeah, I'm just excited to be here and, uh, you know, be part of this panel with so many really interesting people. Um, and I think when we started, we were getting a lot of oysters from like small farms, but places like Island Creek and Hamahama. And we've really started to focus more and more, um, not just on oysters, but seafood in general from this region um, and having people like Barrier Island and uh, Clamor Dave and Ernest mm -hmm. and Ernest. I mean, it's really interesting to connect with the region because people ultimately go to restaurants to connect with nature. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the more focused we've gotten, the more connected we feel, especially since oysters are such a direct line to the environment um, that you live in. So yeah. very exciting. And also like the, I'm from New York City, we're both from New York and I, I it, it took me to move to Savannah to realize that black folks even ate oysters. So that was a real treat to kind of um, you know, expand my own, you know, horizon and learn more about my own culture. So, yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, y'all, for joining us. All right, Gardner, you're up. Wow, what some amazing stories that I can hear from future podcasts and every answer uh, that uh, everybody gave. Uh, I do want to start with the chef, though. I want to start with Chef Mashama. And just, if you could just talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, why it's important to uh, source locally from the smaller form, farms and uh, things like that. And then we'll go with uh, Chef Bashish. Sorry if I mispronounced the name, but you got next. Um, I think it's important because it brings together the community. Um, I think that, you know, there, you can, you can see the disparity. You can see all the seafood houses that have closed down here because of that lack of support. And I think that um, a lot of places in Savannah um, have gone to um, more convenient resources, but sometimes you have to work with those local smaller places um, that don't have, you know, the, the, the resources to give you um, to deliver to you on a weekly basis. Sometimes you have to go pick it up in order to keep those communities vibrant. Like a lot of like, with, even from the video, what Ernest was saying, it's like a three generational um, family business. And if you don't support that family business, if you don't bring in people young, they kind of go into other areas. And I think really showing that the enthusiasm about what is growing around here keeps people employed, keeps the community engaged and keeps the region vibrant. And, um, and it keeps us special because you can't have loquats growing in you know, the Midwest. You only have them growing on the coast and, and those special things make us different. And I think really educating a people about the region is why I think it's important to source locally. We'll see if Vish is still on with yep. us. All right, awesome. I'm here. Uh, so, I mean, to me, yeah, this is about the community you're in, right? I mean, it, it's 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 about making connections. You you have to support uh, the local folks um, because then they support you. I mean, it, it's it's that's how a community grows. That's how you know we we get through times like this. Uh, supporting each other uh, and and the other part of you know being in Mississippi is we have you know a lot of resources that sometimes people don't know about or don't want to talk about or uh, simply are ignored because you know the, the resources belong to communities that have been underserved for a long 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 time and it's it's you know it's 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 an unfortunate thing but you know you have to, you know, for, for me, it was always important uh, to, to seek out uh, smaller farmers or small, you know, small growers uh, 
and and to focus on and and sort of highlight what is available, what is good about a place like Mississippi, uh, and what is good is is these hardworking folks. I mean that you know, in spite of all the difficulties and everything stacked against them, are day in and day out are doing just fantastic work and you know putting out a fantastic product and you know it it is then becomes our responsibility to make sure that we are uh, highlighting these people. Um, and it's not easy. I mean, it's not, you know, none of the big houses carry the, you know, the small growers, you know, oysters from, from the coast. And, you know, we have to get Mississippi oysters through somebody in Alabama, but we'll continue doing that um, because that is the right thing to do. I mean, it is, I mean, if, if we don't highlight uh, what folks around here are doing, uh, then who else is going to do it? I mean, that's, you know, that's basically what it boils down to. I definitely uh, understand where you're coming from on that, man. But uh, a key part of, you know, both of you guys' answer was community. And sometimes, uh, okay, sometimes it just feels like, you know, the odds are against us when we try to make moves, and especially, um, you know, while farming oysters, there can be so many blocks and hurdles. Uh, I want to ask Scott um, from Orchard Point, have you ever felt any blocks or hurdles? Or, and if you have, like, uh, what did you do to overcome and kind of, I guess, persevere to, of course, you have a successful, I think, successful oyster farm now. Yeah, that's a good question, Gardner. I mean, notwithstanding the external events that have affected us over the past few years with, you know, a lot of fresh water in 2018, and then, uh, you know, obviously the pandemic last year, bleeding over into this year. Um, I mean, in the beginning, there were a lot of hurdles from a, a leasing regulatory perspective, especially in Maryland, um, just to give everybody some context. Um, you know, leasing, the leasing laws here changed in 2010 to allow, you know, intensive uh, oyster farming and gear. Prior to that, it was all just the public fishery um, and, and private leasing, but way back, you know, 100 years plus. It's very different than, say, Virginia and how the two states approached it. So um, in the beginning, you know, our lease, our five-acre lease in the Chester River was, you know, heavily opposed just because it was something different, something new. And, you know, I think it, it took us four and a half years to finally, you know, make a home up there with the, and that's the picture behind me, right? In the virtual background with the floating cages and the boat, if you can kind of see there on an anchor, but um, it's off of a, a national wildlife refuge. And yeah, four and a half years it took to, to get the permission to actually do that. And I think farmers are well aware of, you know, coastal opposition and, and, and the normal list of things that, that folks have in terms of concerns. But I think there was an added element, um, even though I'm from the, the area where this first lease was uh, procured, I literally grew up there most, you know, my entire life. Um, I think there might have been some, you know, fear or added uh, opposition just because maybe I didn't look like a traditional waterman from this area. Um, and, you know, that might have been initially and, you know, going to these meetings um, and looking around at other fellow farmers that are either had been established at the time, this is back in like 2012, so a little bit ago, but not terribly long ago. Um, looking at folks at these meetings, these state meetings, you know, trying to get this through, it takes a lot of politicking, you know, and not everybody, you know, I, I kind of stood out because I, I, you know, I appeared different than, than most folks, even though my history and background is, is you know, just as native to this area as, as, as theirs. So um, I think in the beginning, there might've been some public misperceptions or whatever the case may be, but, um, you know, you have to keep, fighting for it. You have to keep being vocal and a big proponent of, of, of what private aquaculture can do um, if you want to get anywhere. So um, yeah, I think that's an uh, you know, example of maybe some initial barriers that, that might be compounded um, you know, based on people's perceptions, that sort of thing. Or, I mean, no, I'm sorry, not boys. Uh, Ryan, did, did you have any issues um, or blocks that you kind of felt would come in uh, maybe for not the, the right reasons or, you know, because of the way you looked or anything like that? Um, I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be able to come from uh, 
I guess some places of privilege when you're talking like education and uh, background and things like that. Um, but I think any, any person of color deals with things, you know, people think racism is just somebody dropping the N bomb or something like that. You know, racism is systemic, um, whether it's getting a loan, right. Or it's, um, you know, dealing with Marine patrol. And so I think in terms of hurdles, uh, that might not be the right word for, for my experience, but, um, I think all of us as minorities deal with the stresses of living in a society that's held up by white supremacy. And that's a, something that we deal with daily, um, whether that's on the oyster farm or in distribution or um, anything like that. So um, I'd say just in a general sense, yes. And then of course that kind of trickles into specifics. Thank you for the question too by the way. Hey, for sure, I'm here for you guys. And um, so um, I do wanna ask uh, just a, a follow-up. Alina, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Because you're also you know, on the oyster farm and uh, you, know, you come in with a strong accent and people might look at you sideways. Yeah, like, and our boys would have, probably have uh, some things to add about the minorities, but um, what I experienced um, coming to to a Grand Isle in the middle of nowhere in the deep south is that yeah people would look at me sideways and I would have to sometimes uh, repeat myself often when they would not understand what I mean and I mean and that would be the only thing that really would upset me sometimes I did not ever experience um, any other uh, uh, unpleasantness or any any other hostility towards me in that sense. Any anything that had to do with um, um, it's just really just uh, that sometimes people would not understand what I'm saying basically, and that's that's all, and I can really live with that. So for me, that was not never a big deal or a big uh, problem. Gotcha. So uh, so let's let's just move on down the line because we we hit the farms and um, we've hit the restaurants, but just, you know what, it's a mean world and people aren't just in your face now. They're, 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 they're hitting you on all aspects and all ends. And we're just gonna talk socially. Me and Julie have had many conversations um, about, you know, just quote unquote bullying or, you know, just people making um, comments where it just, you know, you know, you're pushing for the right thing, um, but you know, people try to skew the way you come off. Um, Julie, how do you handle the the social media lane? I mean, you're, you're a queen at you know social media and everything. How do you handle it? In terms of bullying on social, bullying and just just if you want to share an example or experience. Oh Lord. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, one example that you know of comes closely in mind. I, I typically, I would just preface this saying, the oyster community is so supportive and I've experienced 99.9% .9 positive. And it seems to me like my followers, they, they believe in me, they believe in the things that we do. So for the most part, I don't experience any negativity. That said, earlier in 2020, when I did start using my platform to speak out against Black Lives or for Black Lives Matter, I did receive a couple of, you know, messages, um, just very odd. Um, basically, people saying this is not your place to talk about this. First, first of all, stick to oysters, and I was like, I can do whatever the f I want. <laughs> this is my channel. Um, but then they, it got actually, it escalated to a certain point when uh, an individual went on other oyster accounts and started posting really racist things about me um, being Chinese, uh, potentially being communist, et cetera. And that, that was very hurtful. And that was at a level that I've never experienced before in my life. Um, even though like being from Indiana, it's, uh, it's, it was very strange. So I think to deal with it, I mean, you just kind of have to understand that that's their issue. It's nothing about me or what I'm doing. Um, and just kind of continue trying to do 
good work and meet like and connect with people who actually believe in what you're doing. So it's been very interesting in that in that sense. Um, but for the most part, I think just from my my perspective of being an Asian woman in oyster community and aquaculture, it's it's pretty rare to see. And I guess along the way, I just had to just figure it out and just do what I think is right to do and, and good for um, myself and just the industry in general. Um, and it's been really rewarding to see other uh, people who look like me and other women be inspired by what I'm doing and they also want to pursue this kind of oyster appreciation connoisseurship. So I think at the end of the day, even though there's just been like some, you know, tensions along the way, it's all completely worth it. Thank you so much, Joey, for your answer, and thank you for keeping it rated. And uh, but also, uh, you know, really telling it how it is. Um, Imani, you're a young whippersnapper um, on social media land, and you know you have this nonprofit. Um, just how how do you handle? I mean, you're you're in the prime of social media. How do you handle uh, that those type of things, or have you had any experience with it? Um, well, just like Julie, my experience like within the oyster community, 99.9% .9 of the time has been really positive and like really impactful. Um, I did just get my first um, kind of like, I would say like racially targeted comment the other day though. And I was like, kind of waiting for it. Um, the comment was uh, racism has finally hit the sea when it was like about my, it was like a post about minorities in aquaculture. And just like, you know, Julie said, like, that's like, when I see comments like that, like, I know it's not about me. It's not about what I'm doing. It's about like, kind of what that person is going through in their perception of everything, because truly that statement really doesn't matter and is like really inaccurate because it's, we're kind of, we're bringing people of color back to the Bay. So in ways we're bringing life back full circle, we're bringing history back full circle. It's not about racism, it's not about color. It's not about like where you come from or anything like that. It's about that we have a sustainable focal point of our resources here and everybody should be educated about it. Everybody should be like, that is impacted by it, like should have a opportunity to be like exposed to it. So yeah, when I see those things, I'm just like, all right, well, that's cool. Like. I'm, I'm a pretty cool person I've been told so like if you have a problem like don't want to get to know me like that's that's on you <laughs> kind of thing. Thanks Imani I knew you have a great outlook on that wonderful answer by the way. Um, chef uh, okay I think we lost a chef here but uh, Chef Mashama um, just how is it how important is it to you and, and Chef Trevor also um, just hiring like young, uh, you know, minorities and getting them involved in the industry, um, or is it? Um, do you find an issue with finding uh, minorities who want to come into the industry? That's a very sensitive subject. Like yeah, I absolutely. just feel like um, from the beginning, um, there's been you know a lack of representation at the restaurant. We're trying to really figure out like how to um you know attract and encourage and support people of minority descent to come in and and do what we do and you know we usually you know we usually sort of um one of the things one of the positive notes though that we've been doing we've been working with this program called Ditmas, and you know folks are coming out of um in car being incarcerated and we develop this sort of system where they come in as porters and three or four of them have moved on to be cooks and and um, maintenance people in the building and sort of like exploring those types of um, exploring you know other areas of the food business so that's good but like straight up off the street like it's really kind of hard to like attract those that young bright talent because I think they get discouraged you know and I think a lot of them go 
for um, different types of positions. You know, the, the grind here is real. You know, the building is a little bit of a, 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 it's a bus station. So the building is a little bit of a monster and our expectations are high. And so sometimes, you know, we, when we push people, they're not that interested and it doesn't matter what, where they come from. And so we've just been really trying to support and reach out in every aspect that we can get folks of color in here in every aspect we can. And it's just been an ongoing struggle, seriously. As a, as a black woman leading a kitchen, it's really difficult to sort of sustain those relationships because I think that um, people want different things. They don't, they're not looking for what we're trying to do here, you know? Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that? I think it's hard. I mean, nobody wants to hire more people for like lead positions in this, in the restaurant industry than us. I don't think um, one of the disadvantages when you're a minority or a woman or um, you feel disadvantaged is like, you might go to a restaurant and get bad service and you're like, is it cause I'm black? Is it cause of this? And I think in this very regimented meritocracy environment where you push everybody really hard, um, it's important to manage in a way that people know it's about standards because you don't know if somebody's going to be like, why, why is this so aggressive? You know? Um, and I, it might be a cultural thing. Um, but I, I find that has been hard throughout my entire career, both like, going from the bottom to uh, entering more leadership roles. It's like, to be on the receiving end of that, it's like, you're very conscious of how people are treated um, because you don't know if it's targeted or if it's just, you need to learn how to cook and work clean and um, take responsibility for your space. Yeah. Um, so we definitely like to see more representation higher up the food chain. Yeah, who make the yeah. decisions, who hire the folks to be in the restaurant, who, and you know, who, who create the training programs and, you know, promote. And, um, you know, like this is like from my family's perspective, this, my occupation has always been viewed as a domestic, right? And so we know the history of Black folks as domestics in, in this country. And so it wasn't encouraged for me to kind of like put my head down and, 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 and absorb the pressure from a chef in order to deliver the food that the chef's vision envisions, you know? So when I would come home and talk about those stories, it wasn't directed towards me as a black woman, but um, my black family took offense, you know? And sometimes you have to figure out, you have to, you have to be able to separate that. And so I do think there's some aspects of, um, of, uh, of our culture that kind of puts that guard up that lets us, you know, that doesn't kind of let us move through this industry as, as freely as we want. And then also those things that push down and um, we don't have the representation that builds us up and lets us know that there is a place for us at the, in the higher ups in this industry as well. Appreciate you, Chef. Thank you for that great, great answer, both you chefs. Um, I do, before we go any further, I do want to say, um, I just want to say again, thank you for all the panels who came on because this topic is, you know, not an easy one to talk about. And, you know, it can be a touchy situation. It's like one of those things, you know, you don't talk about at the table, um, but it needs to be uh, brought to the table more and talked about. And be, so we can um, help each other and we can grow together and uh, just, just help one another and be one. And that's one thing you know, that I love about the Oyster community and I felt it from day one is, you know, it's been one, you know, we all work together um, just, you know, as far as like going to local farms and um, just knowing everybody, everybody knows everybody. And that's what I love about the Oyster and Shucky community. Um, but, you know, one of my biggest things that I always try to push and even talk about on the podcast is just bringing up young people in the industry and you know, that could be, you know, working in the kitchen or it can be uh, oy uh, raising oysters and working in the hatcheries and that type of thing. Um, Amani, I just want to ask you, um, because you have this great nonprofit for minorities uh, in agriculture, um, what do you think we can do um, to 
get the younger people in, minority or anybody, just get younger people in uh, earlier um, to help our family grow? Yeah, um, <clears throat> great question. And I think we talked about this on our podcast episode as well. Um, yes, I, I think the biggest thing and the biggest thing that is kind of the foundation for minorities and awkward cultures is, is like really meeting people where they are with environmental education. Like a lot of people create really great programs within, um, you know, environmental spaces and they're kind of, they're really great programs, you know, learning about oysters and fish and, and things like that. But like, we can't really expect a kid or kids that like live in inner cities that like don't have access to the water to like really care about that program. So like when we start at a very young age on all different types of levels in all different types of backgrounds and communities of this is how you affect the environment and like this is how the environment affects you in your everyday life. Like when you turn on your shower, like that's where it comes from. Like this is where, like this is why you should know where your food comes from. Like all of these things so that as they get older, we're still pumping in these like longevity of resources of like, okay, so now that you understand the basics of the disciplines, now here are like some of the areas that where organisms are like really being affected by what we're doing in the environment. And like, this is how we can help in this way. So I think it's just building on that education as time goes on. It's not a one-stop shop. Um, I don't, I don't know any, you know, especially for me and my own personal experience, like I don't learn everything like in the first time. Like it's something that I really has to be integrated, something that really has to be developed and cultivated like throughout time. So I think it's really starting at a very young age and then also just like keep pumping in those those facts and that information of as like people grow up as like career development at a very young age so that when people are growing up and kind of figuring out what they want to do, then they can then step into the aquaculture space like for example, and like already kind of have an idea of like how they're gonna step into it and like how they're gonna impact it. Appreciate you, Imani. Um, so it looks like we're, uh, first of all, I just wanna say, did anybody have anything to add to that? That was a great answer, Imani. I, I had some Gardner to kind of tack on what Imani said, plus the point that the Macintosh has made in their video. and. I think, like, for example, in Maryland, and I keep bringing it back here because that's where I'm most well versed and I guess knowledgeable about, but I think, and Imani, you correct me if I'm wrong, you may know more, but I may be the only minority leaseholder in the state. Um, and so when we're talking about the next generation or young people, I think some of it, you know, could stem from having role models in the industry that, you know, they can identify with or, you um, you know, they look like them or for whatever reason. And I think, in, you know, as that hopefully starts to happen more and more, there'll be more momentum on that front. Um, Cause it's, it's sometimes tough culturally to look at a role occupation or whatever a job and, you know, everybody doing that may look different from you. So, and not that that's the end all be all, but I think that's kind of a, a place where a starting point or a touch point where, if, if you have more people with a voice and you have more people that are actively engaged in, in a certain profession, then it kind of paves the way, so to speak. And to your point, I mean, with, with African-Americans in the Chesapeake, um, just having that full circle where, you know, they were the original people working on the water. Um, and, and that's obviously, you know, shifted over generations. So it's like, how do we reconnect that um, to, to create role models in the modern um, you know, seafood industry that we have here in the Chesapeake? Um, you know, it's just one of those things, whether it's like, you know, that or something completely different, um, you know, like Asian American males in Hollywood or something like that. I mean, where you, it doesn't really start to get traction until there's a few people that kind of break through and, um, you know, make their presence felt. And then it's like that inspires. So, the, you know, not to get too mushy, but, um, you know, the inspiration side of it too. I mean, there's the tangible stuff and the structural stuff that we all need to be aware of and work on. Um, and then it's just, stuff like this where you're, where you're having a voice and you're you're hopefully serving as, as a role model to that next generation. That's great, Scott. And as most people know, um, I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at in this position if it wasn't for my dad teaching me about shucking oysters, the good old oysters. Um, before he taught me, I didn't know it was a thing or, you know, anything. So um, I, I you know, 
seeing him shuck oysters and also competing um, and being the only person. Well, you know, it was the Pratt's, of course, but the only uh, black male that I can remember. I'm sure it might have been, but I don't remember. I remember seeing him and uh, who doesn't want to be like their dad, you know. But uh, uh, Beth, were there any questions from the audience or anything? Hey, Gardner. Yeah, we actually had one from Elizabeth. She said, I'd love to hear the group talk about how to increase the perception of oyster culture as a dynamic food culture bridging many communities and classes. So if anybody has any comments on that, y'all throw them in there. They, uh, they should go to Landlocked. <laughs> Julie, you're so good. <laughs> You know, actually, it's interesting. You know, you were the one that that keyed in first, and certainly, if anybody else, you know, hop in here. But how, like, do you, Julie and Gardner, in particular, like, you know, you all as storytellers? I mean, actually, we're all storytellers, all of us. So I guess I'm just really interested from both of your perspective, like how, because you have so many people pinging you, right? You have like the the foodies, you've got the farmers, you've got students, you've got everybody, like. How do you ultimately decide like, okay, this is the perspective from which I'm going to tell something. And, and more importantly, how do you, how do you unite that story? Cause that's what we're all talking about here is like it's the, the oyster is like the talisman, right? Like that's, that's what unites us all. So I'm just curious about that. Um, I, can, I can, I guess I can speak to that a little bit. And it's really uh, it, early on, there was that la layer of, okay, well, who do we know? in the oyster industry. And there were a couple of books that have already outlined, these are the oysters that you need to know. Today, I think that the industry has really changed a lot. You have these new, new oyster farmers, new chefs that are pushing completely different ideas and also bringing back some of the heritage that has been just buried uh, you know, about oyster culture in this country. Um, so I think that it's great to keep those at the surface and I try to just point out things that are surprising, which actually does better on Instagram, by the way, things that are surprising <laughs> instead of things people know. So that is one thing. And then the other thing is just continuing these conversations, whether it's very casually or more structured um, in any particular way. And one of my favorite like avenues of doing that is to actually engage an audience that already has pretty set perceptions of what they think is is the creme de la creme of oyster society and oyster culture and then make them realize that there is a kind of a different narrative behind it whether that's just like through video or uh, photographs which I particularly love. Awesome thanks Julie. Can I add something Beth? Sure go ahead. Okay so from just like my <laughs> own like career journey and just everything with minorities and awkward culture. I think that, um, sorry, also like there's apartment like construction going on. So if that's what you hear, sorry. Um, but from my end, I think I really, the start of all of minorities and awkward culture, and I know this is gonna sound really weird because Beth knows the story. I actually saw uh, the chef tables um, episode with Mashamba and like Ernest Senior and Junior. I had never seen another African-American person in shellfish. And I saw, literally, I saw the first scene of that show and was like, oh my, oh my God. Like, I was like freaking out in my apartment. And then when I really started, like that sparked, like kind of like where I'm targeting with the demographic of minorities in aquaculture, like women of color, especially African-American women, like I'm such a feminist at heart that like, I feel like all like, sorry to say, but all these men have like all these history books and like all of these things. And like, when I look at the real history of African-Americans, like where are the African-American women? Like, I know that there were like in the packing houses, in the shucking houses, but there's always one rebel in the generation. And I'm looking for to say like, she was out on the boats, like she was doing what the men were doing or whatever. Like, and I think like, that's really why I've really targeted the audience that I have, not because of you know, picking race or anything like that, but that's who I am. I'm a double minority in awkward culture. And so bringing more women of color would just like keep that, um, we'll keep, you know, really having that conversation of who really is the minority here 
um, women in general are, but also women of color are. I think um, I haven't met another women of color working in aquaculture from Maryland all the way down to Texas. So, um, so yeah, like that, I just think that just like Julie said, keeping the conversation going about like what's really going on in our spaces and in the industry and like being real about those statistics and that history so that people feel more comfortable to step into this space. So they feel like they have a space to step into that they can build from. So thank you, Mishama, by the way, sorry. <laughs> thank you, Imani, that was, the, thanks girl. I mean, like, you know, the best part, I they just accepted me. They like, they were, they were down to show me where their oysters were and they were down to, you know, when we first started working with the Macintoshes, they were doing clustered oysters. They weren't doing um, single oysters. And so we still bought them and there would be like claws of oysters yeah. together. And we would try to shuck them and we would put some on ice and people would send them back and we would turn them over and reshuck the ones on the other side and send that back out. And um, he was super interested in just like giving us what we wanted and, um, and cupping oysters. And he was super suspicious about the farm ones because he was very used to, you know, just the wild blade oysters oysters that were you know that come from this region and they just they just were they just we've had this open dialogue and I think that it's just transcended into the space where we start to focus on um, the agricultural community in this region and they they were a big part of that so I'm, I'm glad that I'm, I'm glad that that inspired you seriously because it inspires us too. Awesome, y'all. Thank you so much. Great answers. Gardner, sorry, I saw you're on. Go ahead. Yeah, no, um, I was just going to say, uh, I either we can go to the next question. I saw Ryan Ono had uh, asked a question. Yeah, sure. We've got three, I think three-ish minutes. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, uh oh uh oh I'm not savvy anymore. Uh, if you have the question up, Beth, can you go ahead and read it? Brian wanted to know, let's see. Uh, he said, thinking about the demand side, does anyone have any thoughts on the promotion of oysters slash seafood consumption among minorities in particular? Maybe that could lead to some becoming interested in oyster farming or cooking as a future profession. Oh, can I say something first? Yes. I, I got to chime in. Yeah, um, just do. because I'm not going to take all the three minutes. I'm going to take about 36. Uh, anyway. Um, my first experience was the same as uh, Chef Mashama. And even though, you know, I'm from the Eastern Shore and, you know, it's mostly uh, people of color um, eating seafood, but it's not people of color actually um, harvesting. So moving up to D.C. Uh, in the city, my first experience was not people of color eating seafood. And I was surprised. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? And it took me a year or two before I actually started get, getting customers who are people of color. I'm like, where have you guys been all my life? So I think um, the thing that helped me one is just keep on pushing um, and educating everyone that I come across and letting them know, you know, you, you got to self-promote um, and just telling people, hey, these are oysters. And then you get the people who uh, oysters are slimy, the R month. So it's really an education thing. And then just um, uh, being, being seductive. Oysters are very sexy, be sexy with it. And um, I always lure people in with mignonette. Mignonette on oysters is like a, you know, it's a, it's a what's that? The, the first one is free, you know, and then you're hooked, right? So uh, if anybody else wants to answer, I just had to put that in there. Awesome. Thanks, Gardner. Yeah, I know we're coming up on time. You know, shoot. I mean, this is like... Uh, I didn't want to take all the time. I'm sorry. Dude, no, no. You are... I want to I want to keep talking like all day, you know? And, <laughs> you know, and I, I feel like, you know, we could and we should continue this, you know? Um, I know an hour is not nearly enough. It, it's just not. And I, I wish we had more time <laughs> to be with everybody, but um, I, I do have to wrap it up. And so... I just wanna thank every single one of our panelists for taking the time out of your super busy schedules for joining us and for having this much needed, much overdue and hopefully the first of many more conversations. Thank you sincerely. 
We love you all. Um, everybody who tuned in, thank you for taking the time to do so. Um, you know, again, anybody reach out to Gardner or knowing him, he'll reach out to you if you don't want to get with him, get with Julie. Imani, thank you so much. Girl, we've been waiting for you. Thank you just, you know, for inspiring the next generation and just everyone, you know, just keep being authentic, keep doing what you're doing and let's please, let's just keep having these conversations. You know, next year when we meet in person for our symposium, I really hope I can call on y'all again and bring the community together to continue this. So, you know, thank you again, reach out to me anytime, anybody in Oyster South, I'm gonna be a geek and take a picture of our screen right now. Sorry, I'm doing it because I just love in everybody's faces. So if everybody wants to turn on their cameras, do a little kumbaya. So just thank you so much, everybody. And just wishing everybody a great weekend and just keep eating those oysters. Keep telling the stories, keep talking.